everybody. Welcome back uh, to the stud story. And uh, actually, this one is going to be kind of two stories in one. Uh, we're going to talk about, of all things, Pearl Harbor. And, uh, and we're also going to talk about a gentleman that uh, had the great story that he told me about Pearl Harbor. And uh, so I'd like to start uh, with the guy that I'm talking about. Uh, he was a great old timer, uh, kind of uh, uh, met my grandfather in uh, the 1920s when they were both wrestling out of Columbus, Ohio. But this guy's name was Charlie Carr. Uh, Charlie Carr was a tremendous shooter, uh, trained a lot of great, great wrestlers, uh, had a tremendous career of his own. Uh, when my grandfather left Columbus, Ohio Territory in uh, probably 1930, I think it was, around 1930, and he went to Tennessee and he started to run his own company there, Charlie Carr went with him. Uh, Charlie Carr spent uh, many, many years there, most of his career in that uh, Tennessee territory, which was a huge territory. Um, actually, uh, my grandfather was running at one point in 12 states in the South. So, uh, you know, he was, he was pretty much everywhere. But Charlie Carr uh, trained guys. Uh, and, uh, and I was trained by Charlie Carr, as a matter of fact. Uh, my father was trained by Charlie Carr. And uh, uh, he was, a, as I said, a great shooter. And uh, he, um, he, had, he had an accident, uh, a car accident with his wife. Uh, a lot of wrestlers got hurt in car accidents back in the day. And this was probably in the early 40s, I think. He had this accident and uh, his, he survived the wreck, but his wife died. And, uh, and evidently he loved her a, a great deal. Uh, he never really got over that loss of his wife and he became an alcoholic and he, uh, he drank pretty badly sometimes. They'd go on binges, but uh, he was just such a tremendous wrestler. So uh, my grandfather went to a little town uh, when he went to Tennessee called Dyersburg, Tennessee, where I was born. My brother was born. Uh, gosh, all kinds of wrestlers were born there. It was the wrestling factory in the South in the uh, uh, late, uh, from 1930, basically a while to 1950 or so. And uh, so, you know, uh, my, 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 and I haven't told it a lot about my family tree and we're gonna do that in one of these stud stories pretty soon. We're gonna just go through the entire tree of who they all were. But uh, all of them uh, kind of settled down there. And uh, so, so once Roy went there, uh, his brother Herb came, and then his brother Jack came, and uh, Charlie Carr trained these guys to wrestle. He trained Herb, he trained Jack. Uh, Roy obviously worked with him as well. Uh, that was the first generation, basically. Lester was one of those first original brothers, Lester Welch. But uh, Lester was about the age of my dad. So second generation came along, and Charlie trained the second generation, which was my dad, it was Lester, and um, my grandfather, Roy, had a, a, a sister named Bon, Bonnie, and uh, she married a guy named Virgil Hatfield. And Virgil Hatfield had three sons. And uh, so they became the Fields brothers. Uh, Hatfield, it didn't seem to be a proper name for wrestlers, so they became the Fields brothers. And uh, so uh, when they got started, uh, they wanted to train, they wanted to learn, and they wanted to get into business. So they were related to Roy, they were Welches, uh, and their mother was a Welch. So uh, those three he trained was Bobby, Don, and Lee Fields. So he trained all those guys. Uh, when down the third generation that got trained by him, uh, you know, and, uh, and my brother and I both worked out with him a, a whole lot of times. But back in the early, in the, in the late 40s, after World War II, and all these guys had been in the service and they all came home and they were looking for what they're gonna do the rest of their lives. And uh, Roy's territory was starting to become a big territory and pretty darn successful. And uh, Herb was a world junior heavyweight champion, uh, had some great talent within the family. And so Charlie starts training these guys. Now, Charlie had the drinking problem, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but he was such a great shooter. And he didn't train guys to work, uh, you know, to do high spots or anything like that. He trained them just to shoot. 
And then back in those days, that's what everybody did. If you want to become a wrestler, you had to learn how to shoot and how to be able to take care of yourself. And uh, you always wanted to have that uh, background because you, you never knew when you were going to need it. But anyway, uh, Charlie Carr would come and uh, he would stay in a hotel there and he would get drunk. And uh, he was such a great shooter that uh, the five of them, my dad and Lester and the Three Fields brothers were all about the same time. A guy named Joe McCarthy, who's going to become a world junior heavyweight champion, lived there locally. He trained with them as well. And they would go get Charlie Carr on the mornings, uh, you know, weekend, uh, Monday morning, whatever day of the week. And he would usually be drunk. And he would be so drunk that uh, they would have to carry him and put him in the car, take him down to where the building was and where the ring was, and they would take him, take off all his clothes except for his underwear, and he wore the old boxer shorts. And uh, my dad tells me the story, and uh, he said they would roll him into the ring. He couldn't stand up. He was so drunk he couldn't stand up. And they would all get in the ring with him, and they'd take turns just jumping on him. And they would jump on top of him. He'd be laying on his stomach or laying on his back. And he'd just be, oh, he'd just, you know, he was just totally out of it. And they would just start jumping on him. And when they did, he would just hook them real quick. Bam, he'd hook a wrist lock. He'd hook a whatever hold he was. He was such a great shooter. Uh, they couldn't last uh, two minutes, and he would have them screaming. And once they'd scream, he'd let them go. And uh, they would wrestle him, Dad says, sometimes for two hours, and he would start sweating. And he would sweat himself till he was sober. And uh, then finally, after a couple hours, he could stand up with him, and then he'd go ahead and train him in a normal manner. But the guy was such a tremendous, tremendous talent. Uh, and uh, he was small. He was uh, only 5'6", and he weighed about 180 pounds, built like a fire plug. And he had a whole different style of wrestling, of shooting than other wrestlers. Uh, most wrestlers uh, go to their hands and knees to protect themselves. They wrestle from their hands and knees. He wrestled from his side. And uh, I remember shooting with him a whole lot and he would just lay on his side and he would wait for you to get on him. And when you reached around his stomach or you reached over his head, he was the wrist lock king. He would hook that wrist lock, bang, that was it, it was over. He would also reach down there and hook his leg to counter your leg so you couldn't turn and get out of the wrist lock. So Charlie Carr, the reason I go in this direction is because Charlie lived with us in the 60s. Uh, and uh, as soon as we finished high school, in fact, before we finished high school, I was a junior in high school, Dad put the first wrestling ring in our backyard and Charlie Carr was wrestling for him in the territory. Now, he's an old-timer at this point, but he was still tough. And uh, so Charlie uh, Charlie would work out with us uh, every day. It was an everyday thing, my brother and I. It was a requirement. Uh, I was playing basketball, but uh, in my dad's eyes, wrestling was 10 times more important than basketball. So we were sent to that ring every day, and we spent time with Charlie every day in the ring. Uh, Charlie uh, was uh, such a such a fantastic shooter that, uh, you know, we got to be pretty darn good. Uh, so anyway, in 1968, 67, 68, my first year in college uh, and uh, playing basketball, uh, I, uh, I he moved uh, Charlie in with us because Charlie was getting older at this point. Uh, and Dad was Dad had a big heart, and he found a spot for him in the house, and uh, made him a little bedroom. And uh, Charlie actually lived with us for a while. And uh, I, he told me a story about a year before he died, and I never knew any of this. And uh, and this is where we're going to talk a little bit about Pearl Harbor. Uh, Charlie told me one day, and we worked a lot during the day. Uh, we had a big farm. And my dad always found something for me and Rob and Charlie to do. And uh, so we had a lot of time talking uh, about the old days. And Charlie told me a story. He said he was a sailor in World War II. And he was actually in Pearl Harbor the day they bombed it. And uh, he was on a ship. 
he, ex he kind of described the, the, per the, per the harbor itself. And, uh, and I've been to Hawaii several times and wrestled there and, and usually stopped there going to Australia, going to Japan. Uh, and uh, Pearl Harbor, I'm fairly familiar with. And it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of water, boy, it's fabulous. And he described where the ships were and the Arizona, uh, you know, and, and the history of the Pearl Harbor. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because 80 years, about 80 years and four days ago, uh, it was the 80th anniversary of, the, of uh, the, the day that lives in infamy forever. And it still is in infamy, uh, December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. And uh, Charlie told me, he said, the way the, the way the ships were, he said they had these long rows of ships, and uh, I've been to Okinawa in Japan, and I've seen that our American fleet there in Okinawa uh, travel on a ferry with uh, uh, Stan Hansen and Bruiser Brody, and we went right through this, down through, between ships on both sides, big monster battleships on both sides of you. Uh, the ferry goes right down between all of them, and. Uh, that's the way Pearl Harbor, and I assume all all ports were set up that way, especially as far as uh, naval naval times were concerned. Anyway, um, so he explains to me, he says that the battleship Arizona was down closest to the land. The next one was the Tennessee. He named off the battleships. They were all in one particular part of uh, of the harbor, and he said his ship was way out toward the very end. Two ships from the last one in a row opposite where the big battleships were. And he said that, uh, that about the week before Pearl Harbor, he says uh, they must have had some idea that something was potentially up. And he said that they started running these, uh, these uh, dry runs and uh, I guess they were trying to test, uh, get guys ready for whatever. And he said, uh, they would bring in these, these planes down and they had zeros painted on them like a Japanese plane, but they were just flying these uh, patterns right through the harbor uh, just to, to, uh, you know, to get guys uh, prepared in case something were to ever happen. You know, and uh, obviously they didn't really know what was gonna happen, but he said these were American pilots and they would fly right straight down behind the ships and uh, he said you could see them in the plane sometimes because they were very close. And he said on the morning of December 7th, 1941, that he got up early, uh, just after daylight. And he had a friend that was with him and they went up on the deck of the ship. And he said, he said the very first zero, the very first Japanese plane that came into the harbor, he said came right down like they had been practicing for the, the week prior to that. He said he saw the zero on the back of his wing, uh, you know, the back of the plane, you know, just like the ones that had been painted up to look like the Japanese planes. And he said the pilot was so close, he said he could actually see it, that it was a Japanese in the plane. It was a Japanese pilot. And he thought, you know, and he looked at his friend who recognized and realized that that's a Japanese in that plane. And uh, he said that uh, he, they were, he said they were going to make, he was going to make a comment to him like, did, did I really see that? And he said that Japanese bomber, first one down in the, in the Pearl Harbor, the first pass in, he said zip drifted right off over the battleships. And he said he dropped his first bomb on the Arizona. And the Arizona's a big, huge ship. Uh, 900 sailors died on the Arizona. It went down, they hit it. It, it, it exploded the ammunition and the, and the below the ship and the 900 sailors were lost in that one ship alone. But when that bomb went off, he said they were probably, uh, he said they were probably a quarter of a mile from the Arizona. And he said the shrapnel from the explosion cut his friend half in two who was standing beside him. And, you know, and I was like, are you kidding me? And he goes, no. And he goes, he, he just cut him happened to and he said uh, so I said well what did you do what did y'all do and he says well you know obviously he said the captain and everybody came up on board I mean you know and then he said that first one was followed by a, a wave wave after wave after wave of these Japanese bombers 
and they were just destroying all these ships that were in that harbor. Uh, they never all, they were not going anywhere. He said, but his captain was able to pull that anchor and he was able to pull out of the, out of the harbor. And uh, you know, the, the emphasis, obviously, the Japanese had gone through all these uh, plans uh, they were. They knew the big ships and where they were and the whole thing, and they were all concentrating on knocking out the, uh, the America's finest ships, and uh, that's the ones they were going after. He was on a smaller ship. They got out of the harbor. I said, "What did y'all do?" And he says, "We we set out there." And he says, "Nobody came for us." He said, "Not one plane came to try to take us out." He said, "They were so intent." upon destroying the harbor and every ship that was in that harbor. And he said, we sat out there and he said, we watched them destroy the American fleet, uh, you know. And um, so it, the other day, you know, I, I realized uh, sitting there, you know, and I, I didn't think about it being December 7th. And all of a sudden I see that morning report on the news and it's, you know, 80 years uh, earlier. And it brought back memories of Charlie Carr to me. And at the same time, it brought back memories of uh, this, this horrible moment in American history, uh, uh, that uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And uh, this is a little different. I, I, you know, I hope everybody, uh, uh, you know, forgive me here if you, if you don't uh, really appreciate this story because it's not all a wrestling story. But it is a tremendous story, and it is about one of the great wrestlers of all time, and uh, one of the greatest people of all time. And uh, and I appreciate you joining me as always for this. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you enjoy this one.